All right, so um, welcome everyone to the Aging in Communities much anticipated part two of what we will, what will you leave your loved ones? Mm -hmm. um, our committee's theme for these winter months is the end of life. And Hildy has kicked us off um, last month with a wonderful par part one of our presentation. Hildy Newman, I should give her last name as well, um, began, began us, uh, she uh, got us going in early December. And today she returns with two of her colleagues, Arza Goldstein and Andrew Butler, who will educate us further in planning for the end of life. Coming up next in our programming will be a series of classes in February given by our own Judith Cates, where we'll have the opportunity to see what our classical Jewish texts have to teach us about this um, final chapter in our lives. And following that in early March, Reb Moshe Waldox will give us a class in writing our own ethical wills. So there's lots to look forward to. Watch your, watch your inboxes for when those will be uh, coming up. We look forward to seeing you at all of those. But now um, I will pass the program over to Hildy Newman, who will get us started for today. Thank you, Susan. Uh, so I also um, want to say welcome and thank you for having us. Um, we're happy to be here. Um, and again, some of you may have attended uh, my presentation last month. Uh, I talked on the streamlining your stuff piece of what we're going to be talking about today. So if you're with us in December, some of it hopefully will sound familiar. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the mitzvah of preparing for your eventual end of life and doing what you can to minimize the burden on those you leave behind. We're going to be talking about three domains of planning planning for end of life, planning your estate, and again, streamlining your, your stuff. And our objectives um, for the program are to educate you, to dispel myths, to help you prioritize, and to motivate you to take action. Um, in terms of uh, the format of the program, we're basically going to be presenting um, uh, an introduction, you know, some introductory material, as well as uh, more details in each of those three areas in, in sequence. Um, and then we will be having uh, hopefully time for questions and answers and discussion at the end. So uh, as we go through the program, um, at the end of each of those sections, if, there are, if there's something that you need clarification on, if there's something that you, you didn't catch or, or didn't, um, wasn't clear on, you know, we're happy to take those clarifying questions at the end of each section. But for more general questions and discussion, we'd appreciate it if we could um, hold those questions till the end so that we make sure we get through all of, all of the material. And um, finally, I just want to mention that um, we do have a resource list uh, that's available. And if you'd like a copy of the resource list, please put your email address into the chat and we will follow up and send the resource list to you. Um, so next I would like to, um, just kind of go around the presenters and have us each introduce ourselves, starting off with Arza. Hello, uh, thank you for joining us. It's very nice to have you. My name is Arza Goldstein and by profession, I'm a nurse and I was a hospice nurse for many years. And today I am an end of life doula and I work with people uh, from my home office um, even before COVID, uh, from my home office in Newton, uh, providing guidance and support for people living with advanced, uh, serious and terminal illness from the point of diagnosis until uh, the end of their lives. Uh, my services include healthcare advocacy, advanced care planning, consulting services, crisis consulting services, and uh, education as well as bedside vigil support. I'll be presenting planning for the end of your life. Andrew? Great. Um, I'm Andrew Butler, and great to be here this afternoon. I 
can't think of a better way to spend a, a, a snowy afternoon. Um, so, um, so I'm a, an estate planning attorney with Archstone Law Group in Newton, although I've been working from my um, home, home office uh, down in Sharon where the snow is coming down pretty good right now. Um, I've been in practice for almost 30 years and I help individuals, couples and families put estate plans in place and keep them up to date. Um, I also help families when a loved one has passed away um, to settle and administer the estate. Um, and and um, and my role is the, the the lawyer on the on the panel. I'm gonna just read a, a quick disclaimer, and I apologize for the for formality of this. Um, but I just want to indicate that the information presented this afternoon is solely for informational purposes, does not create an attorney-client relationship, and does not in any way substitute for professional consultation and advice, generally or in a particular case. Attendees should not act upon this information without first seeking professional counsel. We cannot assure you that all the information will be applicable to your situation, accurate, complete, or up to date. And um, over to Hildy. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I'm an organizing and productivity consultant. I'm also based in Newton. And in this role, I guide my clients in finding the balance between their stuff and their life. By lifting the burden of clutter and disorganization, I create calm and functional spaces where people can live, work, and thrive. And I will be presenting this section again on streamlining your stuff. So we're going to start off with just some, um, some comments to help frame the discussion. Uh, so we're all sort of starting from the same place. And uh, Arza, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Hildy. So, uh... I've been in the world of death and dying for many years, and I can tell you with great certainty that we are a culture of death deniers, and really there's no denying that. And you might be asking, why are we coming together now, and what are the triggers? And of course, the answer would be coronavirus. It's dominating our lives. It has for many months now. It's scary. And one of the things that for many people is so frightening about coronavirus is how unpredictable it is, right? So um, coronavirus uh, for those of us in the world of death and dying is a wake up call for so many people because it really forces us to confront the reality that we will die and it might come unexpectedly. Also, many of us are home now with time on our hands and many people are finding this to be an excellent time to address, plan and prepare. So what kind of scenarios am I, gonna, am I going to ask you to think about uh, for the end of life portion of this uh, talk? And we've identified three and we call them domains. My area, as I said, is called planning for end of life, right? I'm gonna ask you to think about um, dying in, uh, in the context of uh, an acute event that might occur, like a heart attack or a stroke, or perhaps a COVID diagnosis that one can either survive or not survive, um, and all the way to a challenging diagnosis, like a cancer diagnosis or a dementia diagnosis, and everything uh, in between. In this domain, I'll be addressing designating a healthcare agent, completing a healthcare proxy form, thinking about advanced care uh, planning, I'll be defining it as well, as well as the idea of creating a, an advanced directive. I'll be briefly touching on funeral planning, but Andrew will be talking about that um, more fully in his talk. Great, and um, I'm the second item there, planning your estate. So my presentation this afternoon will focus on preparing ahead for the period after your death. In particular, I will talk about planning for the disposition of your remains, the disposition of your assets, and for the care of your dependents. And for each of those topics, I will give an overview of the relevant legal documents. And um, I'm gonna be talking um, about uh, 
basically two areas. One is your important legal and other documents, as well as other supporting uh, information that's important for your loved ones to have, such as bank accounts, insurance policies, online passwords, where to store those, how others can find and access them, as well as uh, your physical belongings, those are your personal belongings, your household belongings, and how, we'll go, how to go about paring those down before there's a crisis. And I'm going to, um, hopefully encourage you to consider your legacy, what you do and don't want to leave behind. So Arza, will you uh, take us through emotional readiness? Sure. So emotional readiness is something that we thought as we were preparing, we felt like this is an important topic to cover. So part of framing the discussion is we need to talk about how to be more emotionally ready to talk about your own illness, your own death, your own dying. And by virtue of the fact that you're here, you're probably more ready than most to address what most people would rather uh, avoid. And I really acknowledge you for that. And we have a number of ways of uh, emotionally responding to the area of death and dying. Of course, one of those most popular ways is denial, right? We, you see all kinds of forms of denial when people are talking about death and dying. You see fear, you see anxiety, you see vulnerability, and of course you see overwhelm. And we all know that most things around our death are out of our control, especially when it comes to uh, thinking about where it might happen, happen and how it might happen. Um, those things can be very frightening for people, of course. But how we respond to the idea that we will die and that it's best to prepare is of course completely in our control. So the choices we have around how we respond uh, to the idea of our own death, our own illness, is we can shut down, right? We can procrastinate in order to manage our anxiety, but hopefully with time, you will begin to understand and accept that we all die. And that even though we might be afraid, it's something we need to do afraid. It's something we need to do un even though we're uncomfortable. And we need to recognize that we may experience grief during the process of preparation, okay? So truthfully, it is unpleasant and scary to think about yourself or your loved ones becoming ill or dying. Uh, it's especially true now, excuse me, It's especially true now because we cannot be in the hospital in the same way that we have been able to in the past. But um, this is about this conversation and this idea is really uh, important for all of us to understand that it's not just about how we feel about it, but it's really about uh, the people that we leave behind and what kind of situation are we leaving behind for them uh, if we don't prepare and plan now. Planning and preparing is really a gift to those that we are leaving behind. And if it's not done properly, and again, uh, in the world of hospice, um, we see a lot of families who've experienced uh, family members who've planned and family members who've not planned. And I've seen the lack of planning fracture families or, and, and significantly complicate the bereavement process for those that have been left behind. It's very important, but it's also kind, it's also practical, it's wise and it's helpful to do for those uh, that we love. And we are here to implore you not to leave one, them with a mess. Thanks, Arza. So um, this is really just sort of a, a graphic to show the different domains that we're going to be talking about and how they interrelate. Um, and one of the points that I want to make here is that, um, first of all, there's, there's clearly there's a lot to deal with uh, in terms of the topics we're discussing. Um, and each of the domains that we're talking about uh, encompasses both intangible things like decisions and information, as well as tangible things, such as documents that reflect the decisions you've made and capture information, 
as well as other physical items. Um, the Venn diagram shows that there is overlap and synergy between the domains, and they're all influenced um, by what we're refer referring to as the drivers, which are the specifics of your personal situation, your personal values, your goals, your preferences, as well as other aspects of your situation, such as your religious tradition, family configuration, financial and other resources. So as Arza was saying, there's, there's so much to think about. Many people uh, find it overwhelming to think about, and so they put off dealing with it. But um, you know what we're here to stress is the importance of making conscious choices in advance and not leaving those important decisions up to others um, to make for you, especially when they're in a crisis situation. So where do you start? Well, different people will start at different places depending on what they've already accomplished. Um, again, their own values, goals, preferences and priorities, uh, their personal situation, as I mentioned, their family configuration, their resources, their health status. Um, but additionally, there's a, the practical consideration. What, what can you accomplish now? Uh, for example, one of the things that's uh, on uh, the personal to-do list for my husband and myself is we would like to choose burial plots, um, but we want to choose burial plots in the same location where um, both of our families coincidentally are in cemeteries that are adjacent to each other in Brooklyn, and we're not traveling to Brooklyn right now. So although that's something that's high on our priority list, that's not something that we're going to address now just for practical considerations. So. Um, so that's a factor as well. So um, one of the things that we're suggesting is that there's a basic process that, that's common to all of these domains. Um, the first thing uh, you want to do is educate yourself, no matter which domain you're working in, uh, educate yourself on what are the options um, that are available to you, and then make decisions based on that information. Uh, then formalizing those decisions in documents, whether those are, are legal documents or informal documents such as memos or letters to your family, uh, supplementing those documents with uh, missing information that's, that's of a different nature. I'll get to that a little bit more later. And then storing that, those documents and information in a place where others can access them um, and telling your loved ones where they are. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't do a lot of good if you put a lot of work into gathering and consolidating and, and organizing all of this information, but then no one can find it. So it's very important to let people know um, where, you know where the documents and information are. So um, we're going to move into Arza's section, and uh, Arza is going to start, start us off with just a Jewish perspective on end of life. So thanks, Hildy. So the first thing to know, and again, this is a, a broad brush uh, around the idea of uh, Jewish values around end of life, but uh, as this is a Jewish conversation, we all uh, thought that this was uh, important to bring an element of Judaism into each of our domains. So the first thing I want you to know among the diverse perspectives in Judaism related to planning for end of life and healthcare concerns is uh, one teaching is clear, life is sacred. And the idea of advanced care planning, and I'll talk about that a little more specifically in a minute, uh, honors one's, uh, honors life's sacredness and allows us to consider important questions before a crisis occurs and before our loved ones are left wondering, guessing, and worrying if they did the right thing. So planning ahead allows you and your trusted loved ones to explore Jewish values and use them as a guide for healthcare decision making. Judaism teaches us that studying and engaging in conversations about important issues like end of life is a way of clarifying values and deepening our understanding about ourselves and others. Uh, honest, also honest and caring conversations about healthcare decisions are considered sacred. We uh, Jews have the confessional prayer, the vidui. The vidui literally means confession. It's said in on one's deathbed. We also say it on Yom Kippur. Um, the vidui can be said by either the dying individual themselves 
or can be said on, by, on their behalf by, by someone else. Some other considerations. Uh, what is the Jewish perspective on extraordinary measures? So extraordinary measures include uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR, intubation and ventilation. We he we've heard a lot about ventilation in the, in the COVID uh, era, as well as tube feeding and dialysis in some, in some instances. The Jewish patient has a duty to accept treatment if hope of recovery is available. The other thing to know is that prolonging a state of supported life when there is no hope is not required. And lastly, resuscitation must be done to save a life, even if that life is only spared for a few minutes. The other thing that I thought was interesting um, is how uh, Judaism defines death. And death, uh, I found the definitions of death to be an ir irreversible and complete cessation of uh, vital body movements, including the heartbeat. And there's another school of thought that says that death occurs at the cessation of breathing only. So we are going to move on from the Jewish perspective to the broad conversation of planning uh, for the end of life. So to reiterate, the goal of this domain is to prepare you for the possibility if and when you are in a situation when you're not able to speak for yourself due to serious illness or trauma, your trusted loved ones know, have some idea of what matters to you, right? It doesn't have to be down to the last detail, but some idea is very, very helpful. This graph, I'll go through it very quickly. I know that people like categories. So I uh, illustrated here, it's not my graph, of course, but the illustration here talks about the different ways in which the majority of us experience the end of our lives. So the first category is sudden death, right? Uh, from acute illness, uh, typically it's not survivable. Um, and it's really, you're going along, uh, minding your own business, and suddenly and unexpectedly, you literally fall off the cliff. In many cases, the individual is unable to speak for him or herself for at least some portion of the experience. Keep in mind that unexpected consequences can follow the individual after such an event and can again compromise one's ability to speak on his, uh, for him or herself. The second category is uh, cancer. Uh, it's, uh, that is that deep blue line. Cancer, of course, is a category uh, unto itself. For many people, cancer is a disease uh, that individuals can live with for many months and in some cases, many years. It's towards the more advanced stages of the illness where the ability to speak and make decisions might be compromised. Medications can contribute to that as well as brain metastasis. Uh, the third category is organ failure, like lung failure, heart failure, kidneys. It's the, um, it's the red squiggly line. Uh, organ failure, uh, again, throughout the course of most of this illness, the individual is able to speak for him or herself. Uh, end stage organ failure can affect the individual's ability to speak on their own behalf due to the physiological uh, changes affecting the brain. And the final category is uh, the idea of frailty or dementia. And it's represented by that green line, that solid green, on, green line at the bottom of the graph. Um, for a portion of this illness trajectory, the individual is able to speak for themselves. It's towards the end again, where they typically are not able to. So if you ask me the one thing that really, really matters in all of this conversation, it's my opinion that choosing a healthcare agent is the most important thing for you to do prior to a crisis and in order to have your affairs in order, at least on the end of life planning side. So a healthcare agent is defined as the person designated to speak on your behalf 
Should you not be able to speak for yourself due to serious illness or trauma? Every state calls this individual something different. In Massachusetts, we call it a healthcare agent. A healthcare agent is invoked only when you're unable to speak for yourself and is invoked by a medical professional or team. Everyone over the age of 18 should have should designate a healthcare agent. That includes the your grandchildren, that includes niece, nieces and nephews, that includes anyone over the age of 18 should designate a healthcare agent. Um, please know that each state has its own laws around this and it's best to know uh, the laws in each of the state in which you dis, uh, reside. Completing a healthcare proxy document for every state is also recommended. And keep in mind that the best choice for a healthcare agent may not be the most obvious choice. And this is just my opinion, but I think it's important to think about who the individual is in terms of their accessibility, both physically and emotionally. Are they able to assert themselves when speaking with medical providers, right? Are they assertive enough? Do they um, have enough confidence to be able to look a doctor in a white coat in the eyes and say, this, this is what matters to them and this is what I'm asking that we do. And the other thing to keep in mind is they should, they should be able to follow your instructions, even if they don't uh, necessarily agree with you. Choosing a healthcare proxy, of course, uh, as I said, is important, but also choosing an alternate is also important. What I'm gonna say about the alternate is please let both the healthcare, the primary uh, agent know, as well as the, uh, alternate agent, please let them know that you've chosen them, perhaps why you've chosen them. And equally important, please let friends and family know who you've chosen and why. And do it early because it can be difficult for some people to hear the news. Why didn't she choose me? Um, and so it gives them time to process the information and frankly ask their questions of you. The next thing to talk about is advanced care planning. And advanced care planning is an umbrella uh, process. It's the process of identifying and articulating the things that matter to you should there be a time again when you're not able to speak for yourself. It can include uh, your consideration about anything related to your medical care. So it can include what medical interventions you want and don't want. And it could also include things that are more delicate, if you will, around family issues. Perhaps there's someone you don't want um, around your deathbed, or there's some family member that is, you know, might create some kind of situation. So those are some of the conversations that are important to have and are considered part of advanced care planning. So let me talk about advanced directives. And advanced directives are just the documents that express our wishes or preferences for our end of life care. Ideally, um, we're completing these documents before a crisis. And there are two types of advanced care, uh, they're advanced directives, excuse me. The first is a formal document, it's called a MOLST. And in Massachusetts, we call it a MOLST and it stands for Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. Uh, and I'll show you uh, uh, what that looks like in a minute. Uh, and in other states, it's called a POLST, so Physician Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. And it is technically a legal document. And um, it, there's a lot of controversy, and I will talk about that in a minute, about who, um, who should uh, sign the most and when and things like that. But I wanted to introduce you to the concept of a formal advanced directive as well as an informal advanced directive. And I'll begin with the most form. So the most form, again, is medical orders for life sustaining life-sustaining treatment. It is um, fairly new. And um, I would say that perhaps 
60% of the people in the state of Massachusetts by my um, research, informal research, know what a most form is. And it really addresses what you want and don't want for life-sustaining treatment. And again, what is life-sustaining treatment? CPR, a ventilator, uh, intubation, dialysis, and feeding tube. And please know that in the typical scenario, and uh, the default in, uh, in the medical system is um, do everything. And my question to you is, is that what you want? And even one step back from that, do you really know what do everything means? So as I said, there's not 100% consensus on who should complete a most or post form. Many believe that if you have a strong preference for care, you should complete a most form. So if you know with great certainty that under no circumstances should you be brought into the hospital for, uh, with COVID and they wanna put you on a ventilator and you feel strongly about not being put on a ventilator, a most form might be uh, an appropriate document, document to reflect your strong wishes. If on the other hand, you have a terminal or chronic illness or over the age of 80, um, I would recommend to you that you contact your physician and have this discussion uh, in detail about uh, the most form. So again, most, it stands for uh, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. I will put the link to where you can find a most form in the chat. Um, I will do that right now. Um, and then I will continue. So we've talked about the most form. In contrast, to the most form, there's an informal advanced directive and allow me just a minute to read it. Uh, it's written by a physician. Her name is Karen Boudreau. If you're faced with a decision that you're not ready for, it's okay. I'll let you know what I want for various circumstances. But if you come to something you haven't anticipated, it's okay. And if you come to a decision point and what you decide results in my death, it's okay. You don't need to worry that you've caused my death. You haven't. I will die because of my illness or my body failing or whatever. You don't need to feel responsible. Forgiveness is not required. But if you feel bad, responsible, guilty, first of all, don't. And second of all, you are loved and forgiven. If you're faced with a snap decision, don't panic. Choose comfort, choose, choose home choose less intervention, choose to be together at my side, holding my hand, singing, laughing, loving, celebrating, and carrying on. I will keep loving you and watching you and being proud of you. So that is an informal advance directive. So, and mo most people are very moved by that as I was the first time I heard it. Uh, and you can find that on theconversationproject.org. And it's called Don't Panic, theconversationproject.org. So there's the most form. Most people know it. It's a hot pink, literally a hot pink document. And it's two-sided. And it needs to be signed by you uh, and a physician and, or, and, uh, or a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. So. That is the most form. Again, something to talk over with your, uh, with your medical provider. And uh, last but not least, these are the priorities for uh, planning for end of life. Again, choosing a healthcare agent, completing a healthcare proxy form. I would say choosing a primary and uh, alternate healthcare agent, advanced care planning, writing uh, some kind of advanced directive, if something is very clear to you and addressing funeral and burial arrangements. Arza, did you wanna say a few words about funeral and burial arrangements um, or leave that to Andrew to talk about? I think, I, I think um, uh, the only thing I can think about with funeral and burial arrangements is just the idea that, uh, again, it's, it falls under the category of gift 
to your loved ones and not leaving them uh, having to make that kind of decision and not knowing what it is you would want and not want. So again, um, even, even just in a cursory way. Okay, and I know that um, uh, ours included some resources in the resource list. Um, um, on this, on that topic. So thank you, Arza. We'll shift gears um, unless there's, unless there are any quick questions, just anything that wasn't clear about what Arza just said. Just to note that the re-resource that Arza suggested did not appear in the chat. It did not. Well, it's I will address two. that now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And and if not, it I think it's also in the resource list that, that we'll be sharing. Correct, Arza? And one, just one quick question. I understand that uh, these are not legal documents, that they can always be, at least not for now, maybe they will eventually become legal. And I know some cases where uh, they have been overridden by medical yes. professionals. Yes. So yes. Well, uh, without yeah. getting into a... Uh, uh, at that point to get into some sort of controversy with uh, medical staff. Has, what's you, what do you see as the attitudes these days? As you said, the de default is do everything. Correct. I think that's maybe one of the reasons that hospital costs are what they are, that yes. you spend uh, thousands and thousands of dollars for a number of weeks of life. Yes. And not, I'm not devaluing life, but sometimes you think about the ethical yes. dimensions of that. So uh, how, how is it in Massachusetts? Have they been respectful of these uh, of these directives or no? So, so Reb Moshe, I don't know that I can answer for all of the state of Massachusetts, but I think I think what I can say with some confidence is the fact that there, for many providers, there's a sense of relief when people are clear, mm -hmm. and for some providers, they are um, they're not comfortable with people making decisions that are that feel like you're ending someone's life prematurely so it's uh it varies with the uh, medical professional i think it does i think it does and that's the another reason to have a healthcare agent because that healthcare agent can come in with some agency right and say we've had this conversation this is what mattered and i'm confident this is the right thing to do yeah, and, uh, and really you. be your advocate, right? Be, a, be yeah. a, a personal advocate as opposed to a piece of paper. Exactly right. There, there was also just, um, I don't know if anyone saw it, but there was just an article about this in the New York Times, I think over the weekend, um, about lawsuits that have come up um, as opposed to being wrongful death lawsuits, they're wrongful life, hmm. where people are, you know, where family members were arguing that a person had an advanced directive or you know a, a most in place and it was disregarded and it caused someone to help and i think part of also in the struggle of covid and i know we have to move on but yes. in the in the era of covid i think part of what the healthcare providers have been struggling with is without some kind of clear documentation they are the ones having to make decisions on how to proceed with somebody's life and it really contributes to their moral distress so if someone comes in with some clarity, they don't have to carry the burden of that kind of decision-making. I, I know recently just in one, one case where there was a bit of an issue when they, the person who had uh, directives wanted to be taken from the hospital and returned to his home in order to actually die in his own uh, domicile with his family around him, and especially with COVID, that would not have been possible right. to have the fam family there. Uh, do you find that uh, hospitals are amenable to these kinds of things or they uh, object to it or are they pleased in this day and age to get someone else out of the hospital so they have a bed? You know, I, I haven't, I don't have a lot of information on the hospital. I, I know when I was in hospice, the hospitals were very eager to get their dying patients out of the hospital okay. and not to be cynical, but I think it impacted their numbers. And now I think COVID is probably layered um, over the whole conversation about dying in the hospital in a very different way. Um, but I think prior to COVID, they were very, very happy to um, 
to have people dying at home if they had the right support, absolutely. Uh, and now I think because of COVID, they understand the need to have people die. And now people that are coming into the hospital are only to be with their loved ones are only those people whose loved ones are at the end of their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, why don't we, uh, why don't we move on to uh, Andrew's section on estate planning. Great. Um, so I thought I'd just quickly lighten, lighten the mood here with a little um, estate planning humor. So I guess that's, I guess that's me there on the couch, although I don't think I've ever had that much hair. And even when I had more hair than I have now, it was, it was never curly like that. But, uh, but yes, I, my practice is sort of in the, the field of, you know, death, death and taxes, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's important work. So, um, so I'll just jump right into um, the uh, material here. So, um, so estate planning. Um, so I've sort of broken this up into sort of the primary or main reasons. Um, and these I'm gonna talk at, you know, at least some length, although, you know, can only do so much in, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. So this is, Excuse you know, the goal today is just to sort of, you know, raise some issues, get people thinking, but but obviously um, we're not going to get into too much detail on, on anything, but there'll be some detail, at least on these sort of primary reasons. So, um, so why do we do estate planning? Um, uh, expressing your wishes regarding funeral, uh, burial, cremation, etc. cetera. Um, Secondly, um, putting a plan in place to provide for your dependents, whether those be uh, minor children, um, adult children with uh, disabilities. Um, uh, many of us are helping take care of elderly parents. Um, and then some of us might have pets we wanna make um, sure that are, they're taken care of if we're not around. Um, and, then, um, and then the last, which is probably what people think about most when they think about estate planning is um, providing for the disposition of your assets at death, okay? So those are the main reasons and turning to the sort of um, secondary reasons. And, and these, honestly, I mean, these are all still really important. I just, whatever, sometimes I didn't, just didn't wanna put everything on one slide. So um, minimizing estate taxes. I mean, we could spend a, you know, a week on different estate tax planning strategies, but, you know, again, we'll, uh, we won't, we won't get into that today. Um, planning for the possibility of incapacity. Um, obviously, Arza talked about that a bit. I'll go a little further on that as well. Um, if you're an owner of a business, um, your estate plan needs to address business succession planning. Um, and then, um, and this really kind of gets more into sort of elder law and again, sort of beyond the scope of today's presentation, but but sort of asset protection and including um, long-term care planning. So, you know, sort of, um, getting the long-term care that you want, but, but in a way that, you know, sort of financially works for you as well. Um, so, all right, uh, next slide. Um, all right, so um, the first of kind of those main reasons, disposition of your remains, okay? So we start with, um, you know, what are the different options? So um, again, you know, burial, cremation, um, many people are, um, you know, either organ donors or, you know, might even consider donating, you know, their, their body, you know, entirely um, for this, you know, medical study. Um, my daughter is in medical school right now. And, you know, last year she, um, you know, had anatomy and, you know, worked with a, um, a cadaver for, you know, over the course of you know, two or three months. So, um, so that can really, you know, be, be, be helpful. Um, so um, what are some of the factors to consider? Um, so, you know, you, you know, in some ways you, you hate for, you know, money to, to factor into, um, you know, the disposition of your body, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a reality. Um, I mean, obviously certain options, you know, cost more than others. Um, environmental considerations may be important to you, okay? Um, and you know, so that may factor into your decision. And then, um, and then finally, and, and, you know, but this, you know, for a lot of people this may be, you know, most important, um, is you know sort of spiritual you know religious practices um, you know traditions either within your religion your family etc and and taking that all into account okay um, going back to the financial piece um, so um, you know one way of perhaps saving a little bit of money is that there are you know what are called prepaid um, 
you know, final burial or final expense plans where you can sort of, you know, kind of do everything ahead of time. Um, sometimes you might save a little bit of money that way. It's also really more in terms of saving a headache for your family because you've sort of already made the arrangements and they don't have to struggle to make some of those decisions after you've passed. Um, and then it's really important, and I, I think Hildy talked about this earlier, just sort of in the broader context, but, but specifically here, it's really important to document your wishes. Um, I mean, it's sort of <laughs> beyond obvious that, that um, if you don't document it, um, and then and you've died that it's it's kind of too too late at that stage so um you know documenting it letting letting your you know family and loved ones know what your wishes and, and are and what arrangements you may have already made okay um all right so that was um kind of main main topic number one um i apologize i just have to just have it open a door for my dog <laughs> All right, so. The joy of working from home. Sorry about that. Um, it was perfect timing though, because I'm getting to the slide where we mentioned that. So. Um, all right, so caring for your dependents. So, um, you know, many of us um, are, you know, sort of in the sandwich generation where we have, you know, both, you know, our own kids and, but we're also as, you know, being the kids of, of elderly parents, we're, we're you know, concern with them as well. So, um, and um, so, you know, if you, if you do have children, if they're minors, um, you need in your estate planning documents, specifically in a will, um, you would name a guardian or guardians, you know, for those minor children in Massachusetts, um, a minor, someone's a minor until they reach age 18. Um, but, you know, even beyond that, you know, um, if you have a child who has special needs, um, you know, 18 may not, you know, sort of be, be the end of the story and you may need to make arrangements for them even beyond that age. Um, may not necessarily rise to the level where you need to get appointed as like an ongoing guardian, but you may need to make some sort of financial arrangements. Um, a, a, what we sometimes refer to as a special needs or supplemental needs trust may, may be appropriate. Um, and again, that's a, that's a top, that's a topic with a, you know, a lot of a lot of detail, but just raising that issue. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned before elderly parents, um, you know, and there can be both sort of financial considerations. Maybe you're helping um, helping with some them with some of their living expenses. And if you're not around, um, you know, putting something in place to kind of replace that 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 um, income or, or that those financial resources for them, but also practical considerations. You know, if you're the one who's um, ordinarily take them to doctor's appointments or bringing them, you know, you, you bring them meals, you know, two, three days a week. Um, if you're not around to do that, um, have you, you know, um, put some arrangements in place, put some, uh, made some provisions so that, uh, you know, that, that those tasks can, uh, can still take place. And then again, I mentioned pets. I have, you know, I've never done one, but Massachusetts actually allows for a pet trust. So you can actually have a a trust with a trustee and put money in there to take care of your pet um, client. Most of my, you know, my clients who've done some things like that haven't gone to the level of a trust. They've just said that they've left their, you know, cat, dog, whatever, to a person, and they might leave, you know, a few thousand dollars to um, to help with their care. Um, so, um, so that's dependence. Um, and then again, you know, this is the one that maybe pe people think about first. Um, but you know, I'm kind of mentioning it, mentioning it uh, last year in terms of kind of the main topics. But disposition of your assets, okay? Um, so, so and these sort of fall into to a few different categories. Um, you know, one is is what we call tangible personal property. So these would be things like jewelry, you know, a necklace, a ring, um, a bracelet, um, um, a watch. Um, you know collectibles you you have um you know a a, a um, collection of of you know old records or you know in my case you know baseball cards the ones that my parents didn't already throw away um uh artwork uh, other items around the house and and the idea here is that you you may have specific items that you want to go to specific people you know there's a there's a ring that you know you really want your, um, you know, your daughter to have, or your niece to have, or there's a watch that you want your, 
you know, particular grandson to have, and and um, and maybe other other items as well. And and rather than put those sort of in the legal documents, whether it be in a will or in a trust, generally we address that more informally. And so what I recommend to, to clients that they do is is to type up or handwrite a, you know, a letter, a memo. There's no set format. Um, I just recommend that they sign it, put a date on it, just so we know it's the most current version. Um, and that's the kind of thing you can, you know, sort of change over time on your own. Okay. Um, the next category here, and, and the reason I have it in, I don't know if it comes through on your screen or not, but in sort of bold, bold lettering is what we call non-probate property. And the reason I, I bolded it is that I find that this is probably the single most um, sort of form of confusion or sort of misconceptions. And then what I mean by that is that um, a lot of people think that if I have a will and I say what happens to my property in there, that doesn't matter what else, what other provisions might exist, my will trumps all of that. Um, um, and the answer to that is no. Um, there's actually a lot of property that doesn't pass under your will. And even if your will goes to great lengths to say where it goes, um, it doesn't matter because these are items that pass just based on their own terms. And so, so here, here are three examples. So life insurance. Okay. Andrew, Andrew yes. can I interrupt you for a minute? I think there might be noise coming in your home from another room possibly. Oh, sorry. Um, it's a little distracting on the... Yeah, um, sorry about that. That's okay, thank you. Um, so is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's li literally a three ring circus here, but, uh, um, so, um, all right. So life insurance and retirement accounts, um, you know, if you have those, you've, you probably, you know, remember, um, perhaps you remember filling out a beneficiary designation. Um, so, you know, if you're married, you know, you probably have your spouse as primary and then, you know, children or, or other you know, people as, as contingent or secondary. Um, so it doesn't matter if in your will, you've said, I want my life insurance to go to person X. If the beneficiary is person Y, that's who it's gonna go to, okay? Same thing with retirement accounts, okay? And then also joint property. So a lot of people own their, if they're married, they own their, house, their home um, jointly with their spouse, okay? They might be joint bank accounts. And again, what happens at the first death, it automatically passes to the survivor. So um, so it's really important when, you're, when you are putting together your estate plan, your will that you think through or take into account these other, what we call non-probate assets. Because so probate means related to the will. So these are non-probate meaning passing outside the will, okay? Um, obviously you need to address what happens to your real estate, whether it's your primary residence or a, a vacation home or property that maybe you rent out an investment property. Um, bank accounts and investments, okay? And here I'm talking about investments, I'm talking about non-retirement investment accounts, okay? Uh, and then if you have an interest in a business, um, you know, if you're a part owner or something, um, you wanna address that in your estate plan, okay? Um, we'll move to the next slide. What happens if you don't plan? Um, and you can see a, kind of a, a, a whole host of, of of problems, you know, can arise. And, and just quickly pointing out the second item there um, that your assets would pass under the laws that in test to see. A lot of a lot of people might think if I don't have a will, you know, my assets could end up going to the state. The answer to that is no. They do pass under the state laws of intestacy, but that doesn't mean it goes to the state. It just means it goes to kind of your closest living relatives and their um, laws in Massachusetts that sort of define who that would be. Um, and you see some other potential issues if you don't plan, okay? Next slide. Um, so um, again, just indicating, so this is sort of the, the laws of intestacy. So um, we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so, le so let's get to the legal documents. We kind of talked through these, you know, property and these other issues, but yeah, I mean, everybody wants to know, well, you know, but what, <laughs> what about the documents? So here they are. Um, so a will, um, a revocable living trust, durable power of attorney, healthcare proxy, which ours already touched upon, um, and a HIPAA release that goes with the healthcare proxy. Other than the revocable living trust, um, the other four are really what I would consider, consider the core or essential documents. Revocable living trust, it kind of depends on your situation. The other four, 
I think are really, you know, kind of absolutes. You really have to have them. Okay. So again, I talked earlier, um, a will, it disposes of the tangible personal property that you didn't list in that letter or memo. Okay. Um, I'll beat the dead horse and indicate again, it only disposes of probate property, not the non-probate property. It's where you appoint what we call a personal representative. You're probably more familiar with the term executor, uh, but a personal representative of your estate. And if you have minor children, it's where you would name a guardian for them. Um, and it's if you're interested in making a charitable bequest, such as such as to your synagogue, uh, um, um, a, a you know a, a bequest, uh, you know provision in the will is a really straightforward way to do that. Um, so. Uh, again, revocable living trust. This is the one that's kind of maybe you need it, maybe you don't. Um, it provides, um, allows you to avoid probate on those probate assets as opposed to the non-probate ones. Um, it's generally preferable to what we call a testamentary trust, which is a trust that's sort of contained within the will itself. Okay. Um, while a revocable living trust doesn't save estate taxes itself, um, it does allow you to do estate tax planning, okay? Um, and so it tends, to, and so in general terms, a revocable living trust sometimes referred, um, um, it tends to make the most sense when you either have minor children and or you have a taxable estate. So if you have both of those, then it is probably a really compelling case for you to have, have a living trust, okay? Um, and then the incapacity documents, um, durable power of attorney, um, so this allows someone um, to basically handle your day-to-day -day financial affairs um, during a period of incapacity. So you get very sick, you're in a car accident, um, perhaps a, later in life, you know, dementia, things like that. And there's some period of time where, you know, someone needs to pay your bills, file your tax returns, deal with a business if you have one. Um, so this is what the power of attorney, durable power of attorney provides for. Um, the person you name in it is referred to as your attorney in fact. Doesn't mean they need to be a lawyer. Um, I get that question sometimes. Um, but it just gives gives someone the, the ability to do all those things on your behalf. We typically set them up so that they're effective right away. Um, we don't typically provide that there has to be proof of incapacity because that can really slow things down. Um, and it's a good idea to update these every five to seven years. Um, you some, I sometimes hear from clients, they'll call me from the bank and say the bank won't honor it because they say it's, it's stale. The bank really has no legal right to say that, but unfortunately they still do say it. So it's good to um, just get a fresh date on these somewhere in that five to seven year time frame. Um, and then finally, um, and again, you know, um, ours are cover this, um, you know, pretty good detail earlier, but just I'll just hit a couple quick highlights in terms of the healthcare proxy. So, um, you know, you should have one in, in any state that you, you know, spend spend time in. Um, I mean, the Massachusetts healthcare proxy is valid in New Hampshire, Florida, wherever, but a doctor, nurse, et cetera, in Florida is used to seeing, you know, the Florida form and the Massachusetts one, they might, you know, ask some questions about it. So um, you're gonna name a healthcare agent in it. Um, you should also have a backup. And you know, as ours indicated, it's important, you know, it can be really important to couple it with, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, a living will is a term we use or just an advanced directive. But the point is a, a document that that your healthcare agent can sort of turn to and give them some guidance. Obviously you want to, it's also really important to talk to your healthcare agent and I and I think it was ours that, that um, referenced the conversationproject.org as being an amazing resource um, in terms of how to have that conversation with, with someone you've designated as your healthcare agent. Um, and then the final document is a HIPAA release. This goes with your healthcare proxy. It just makes it very clear, you know, from a legal standpoint that it's okay for um, doctors, nurses, uh, medical um, nurse practitioners, et cetera, to share your personal medical information with someone serving as your healthcare agent. So I often have clients, you know, sign those together and give them both to their, to their doctors ahead of time. Um, and I think that's it in terms of the documents. Um, so just quickly, cause I wanna leave plenty of time for Hildy. Um, uh, key takeaways, um, 
So when you're doing your estate plan, you know, you know, work with a qualified attorney and, and not only put it in place, but make sure it's updated periodically, um, ensure your beneficiary designations and the way you, your assets are titled, that those are consistent with your estate plan. Um, store your documents in a secure place and give relevant people copies or access. In my office, we use something called everplans.com. Um, and I think I've got it in the resource list, but it's a um, sort of an online digital vault, digital organizer that's really helpful for these documents and for other reasons as well. And again, talk to your family about all this stuff, where you want to be buried, um, your wishes regarding end of life care, um, care of dependents, et cetera, et cetera. And with that, I think that's my last slide. I hope so. <laughs> I will... Um, finish up and, and hopefully if, if we've got some time at the end and people can stick around, I'm happy to um, answer more, more questions, so. Yeah, and if it's all right, I, I think we'll, 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 we'll not take questions right now and move to the next section and yeah. take, take questions at the end as time permits. So, so um, again, I'm talking about your stuff and, and why am I talking about your stuff? It's a little bit different than uh, what ours and Andrew were talking about. Um, but basically the, the, your stuff uh, for the purposes of our discussion um, includes your documents, as I said earlier, and some of the, you know, many of these documents are things that Arza and Andrew uh, already mentioned. But aside from these and other papers, we all collect lots of other stuff over our lives. And if you think about your loved ones having to go through everything that you own without you there to guide them, it's, it's really a daunting thought. And uh, it's really a kind and caring thing not to leave them with a mess after you're gone. So today I'm gonna to be talking about considerations for storing the import, your important end of life and estate documents, as well as approaches and strategies for streamlining your personal and household belongings. So first, your documents and related information. Um, again, as, as ours and Andrew both mentioned in the course of planning for your end of life and your estate, you, you have already or will create um, several legal and other kinds of documents, including the healthcare proxy. Um, you may have a formal or informal advanced directive, wills, trusts, et cetera. Um, and you'll also likely have other information that's extremely important for your loved ones to have. And that would be things like insurance policies, uh, bank account information, contact information for your healthcare providers, your accountant, your lawyer, et cetera. Um, you may have information related to um, the disposition of your remains like um, prepaid funeral plans or burial plot information. And there may also be things like, you know, maybe you have a safe deposit box. So where, you know, where there's going to be a key and there, someone needs to know where, you know, what bank is that safe deposit box located at? And of course, um, with so much now online, there's, there's all of your passwords that somebody would need to have in order to be able to access important information. So, and someone needs to be able to find it uh, when they're needed if you're unavailable. So, um, there are a couple of different options I'm going to, to mention. Um, one is something that's uh, referred to sometimes as a death file or a death book. This is uh, the case where you take all of your important documents information and you store it all in a clearly labeled folder or notebook. And, and that's a good way to, uh, to go if your situation is fairly straightforward and there's not all that much, um, that much information, that many documents. Um, if you have a more complicated situation, there's more paperwork, um, you've got you know, a, an elaborate filing system like I do, um, another way of doing things is to have something that's sometimes referred to as a just-in-case memo. So it's one place where you would go or someone would go and it's basically a roadmap to where everything else is located. So it would say things like, you know, insurance policies are in file folders you know, labeled here, in this particular file cabinet. Um, and uh, bank account information is, is, is you know, it, here are the banks, here are the account numbers, and, and here's the password that you may need. So it, all that information is basically, it's, it's in logically labeled files and folders, but there's kind of a master list that points someone to where to find that information. And Andrew also mentioned, um, you can keep some of this information in digital format, either on your computer or in a cloud-based repository, 
As Andrew mentioned, it can be um, shared online. This is particularly good if your loved ones aren't local. So multiple ways of doing it, and you can choose whichever option makes the most sense for you. But again, the important thing is to make sure that someone knows, knows that this information exists, knows where to find it, and has access to it. So I just wanted to just quickly show this is um, uh, someone that we worked with gave us permission to share this. Um, and it's just, a, uh, just to give you a visual of what a just in case file looks like. It's just, this is just a couple of manila folders, um, which just provides you know, some of the important documents and then a memo that uh, where to find other documents as needed. And um, uh, when this person showed this to me, uh, I, you know, my reaction was, that you know, if and when, and hopefully in the, the very far away future, when someone cr comes across this, um, when they need it, their reaction would be, you know, just thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for getting this information organized for me. So um, I just want to say a couple of words about ethical wills because they fall into this um, area of important documents. And I know that Reb Waldox is going to be giving a whole presentation on this, I think in the March timeframe. So I, I won't spend too much time on it, but I just want to say just a few. You're freezing. Um, so essentially an ethical will is a document that passes ethical values from one generation to the next. Uh, and it's really the, um, it's based in, uh, it's an ancient document from Jewish tradition. The original template for its use came from Genesis in which a dying Jacob gathered his sons to offer them his blessing and request that they bury him not in Egypt, but instead in Canaan uh, with his ancestors. Another example occur occurs in Deuteronomy where Moses instructs the Israelites to be a holy people and teach their children. Uh, the early rabbis urged men to transmit the tradition's ethical teachings. Men communicated these to their sons in oral form initially and then later in letter form. So that's kind of the, the Jewish uh, traditional context. In terms of content, the content can be similar to a memoir or an autobiography. Um, uh, ethical wills can contain things like uh, family history, personal life experiences, uh, insights into uh, professional career choices and accomplishments that an individual's made. Um, but it's differentiated from a memoir or an autobiography by its intention to transmit love and learning to future generations. So those could be things like blessings and expressions of love for, pride in, hopes and dreams for children and grandchildren, cultural and spiritual values, life lessons and wisdom, requests for forgiveness, uh, rationale for philanthropic and personal financial decisions, and requests for ways to be bear, uh, to be remembered after death. Um, and I apologize because the, um, the the cartoon that I'm showing does have a have a priest standing next to the bedside. So take that with a grain of salt. I I couldn't find one one that was uh, was more specific to the um, Jewish tradition. But the other thing that you, that uh, could be included here, especially if there are um, Andrew mentioned, you know, leaving particular items to particular individuals, there could be stories about meaningful objects that you're leaving for certain uh, people to inherit and why those things are important and what the background is of those items. So again, um, it's a separate related topic. Um, I just want to mention it and, and not spend more time on it right now. But um, so, so then there's, you know, there's the documents, there's the information, and then there's all your other stuff. Um, and we all collect so much stuff during our lifetimes. If you think about everything that you own, you think about your loved ones having to go through it all and dispose of it after you're gone. And if, and if you feel overwhelmed thinking about that, you know, imagine how they'll feel um, when they're also stressed and under pressure and, and grieving your loss. So we can minimize this burden by taking responsibility, by proactively streamlining our possessions. Um, and if your possessions are important to you, you'll want to make sure that they're dealt with appropriately. But again, it's a mitzvah not to leave um, a mess for others after you're gone. So um, in terms of kind of a mindset uh, to think about this, I, I like to think about kind of a, a, the mindset of, of curating your collection. So what does it mean to curate something? Well, curating is the act or process of selecting, organizing, and caring for the items in a collection. So curating your stuff 
is the process of reviewing your belongings, um, selecting what's most important and letting the rest of it go. And what I like about this mindset is that it, it reframes the process. I mean, people don't wanna think about, oh, I have to get rid of this, I have to get rid of that. This reframes the process as a positive process where you choose what you want to keep rather than sort of agonizing over what you're what you have to get rid of. And I want to say just a, you know, just some thoughts about, about you know, what's a keepsake. Um, so um, you know, a, 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 your loved ones may not value your things the same way you do. They may have different lifestyles. Um, for example, they may not entertain formally. So even though your china and your crystal and your silver are very meaningful and important to you, if they, you know, if they don't entertain formally, they're not going to have place the same value on those things as you did. Um, they may live in smaller homes. They may not have room to store those items. But explaining the history behind uh, uh, certain items um, may enable them to appreciate those items more. But try not to be offended if your loved ones have different thoughts than you do about your personal belongings. So um, I, I said, um, you know, talking again about your legacy, um, I was talking about sort of the curating mindset. And um, I want to say that that mindset provides a framework for streamlining your possessions. Um, and I mentioned that it enables you to select the best items um, for keeping. What I, what I didn't um, talk about was that the curating mindset also um, encourages you to think about heirlooms, um, to think about um, what are the keepsakes that you want to pass on, uh, pass on to others. So um, those might include things like I mentioned family history, letters, um, stories, photos. You might want to take some of those items and put them together in some kind of a format that can then be shared with others. For example, I took, um, my father liked to take a lot of photos. He had a very interesting life. And we did some oral history interviews with him that I then had transcribed and put together um, into chronological sequence and basically collected all of that information and created a book of my father's life, which I could then give copies of to his, to his forebears. So um, um, another example of that would be, you know, family and children's photos and keepsakes. Uh, family recipes can be collected into, into personal cookbooks. Um, another category is special collections. Um, Andrew mentioned his um, baseball card collection. Uh, you may have a collection of, of artwork. Um, you may collect, um, you know, vinyl records or antique sports cars or whatever it is. You know, when, uh, when you're no longer uh, available, you want to know that those items are, are going to a place where someone can, uh, can value them and appreciate them. So you may want to make some um, notes about, you know, maybe there's a particular historical society or uh, association uh, that have a particular interest in some category of your things. And you might want to make some, you know, make some notes about that because that's something that you'd be knowledgeable about and somebody else might not be. So um, the other thing that the legacy mindset does is it helps you to prioritize and um, focus on particular tasks. For example, do. And what are the things that really somebody else could do after I'm gone? So um, for example, again, in my case, uh, I'm sort of the family genealogist, right? And if I knew that if I didn't do this project of putting together my dad's story, it wouldn't get done. And then eventually it would just get lost. So um, you might wanna think about what are the things that, that, that I would do or that somebody else in the family would do. Let's make sure that those important personal projects get done um, before they're lost. So um, I already talked about what's a keepsake. So I want to talk, and uh, I know we're, we're getting kind of tight on time, so I'll try to go through this kind of quickly. Um, when you actually go about uh, streamlining your possess possessions, one way to look at it would be to think about what is the time frame that I have available to work on this project. So um, when you start is going to de you know, depend on your situation. Again, um, you may have um, a natural trigger for example, uh, you're retiring, so you have more time. Uh, there's a divorce, so you're splitting up the household, or you're downsizing. Um, there may be, you may pick an arbitrary date, like I'm gonna start working on this on 
my 60th birthday or my 65th birthday or, or whatever the date is. But I would suggest that the best time is now, right? Because the process is gonna take time and it's gonna take more time than you think. And so it's better to start earlier when you're younger in better health and with more energy and to work on it, you know, in, in uh, continuously in smaller chunks than saving it for, for a big push at the end when you might be under more stress um, and not make um, as thoughtful decisions. So um, I would suggest um, the top priority, no matter what your time frame is, is items that are, are personal or private in nature. And these would be things that you would not want somebody else to find when you're not around to help them process those items. So these could be things that are either just, you know, they're, they'd be embarrassing for someone to find, they'd be hurtful for someone to find, that kind of thing. You wanna think about what, what might I have that would be embarrassing or painful for someone else to come across and maybe think about getting rid of that sooner rather than leaving it for someone else to find. Some of the things that are in, in that category, I would say is personal journals, um, love letters um, that you may or you know may not want someone to find, particularly if they're from someone other than the person who is your spouse. Um, your, you know, those love letters from old boyfriends or girlfriends, um, other intimate items that you wouldn't want someone to find. So again, um, what you do next depends on your time frame. I would say if you have a short time frame, for example, um, you are um, you have an upcoming deadline because you're moving. I would say that you know the way to approach that is to plan backward, you know, from your move date to consider um, the the um, size and configuration of the space that you're moving to. So your target space may be smaller than your present space. So think about you know how many bedrooms am I going to have? Am I going to have a separate dining room? What kind of storage spaces am I gonna have? Will I have a garage? Will I have an attic? Will I have a basement? You may not have those spaces that you have now in the space that you're moving into. Um, and also your storage space. You may not have um, the same number or capacity of closets and cabinets. So you need to think about that um, and, and what that target space is gonna look like. Um, so I, I suggest if you have a short time frame, you've got to move sort of efficiently from space to, to space and document the disposition of things as you go. Um, and uh, so you want to prioritize dealing with the contents of those storage spaces because you may not have those spaces and leave projects like um, photos and papers for later because they're very time consuming and you don't necessarily buy a lot of space back. Um, so like, for example, you think about the amount of time it would take you to go through, um, you know, six boxes of, of files. And you, if you get rid of one table or one sofa, you know, you've basically bought back that same amount of space. Um, if you have a long time frame strategy, so you don't have an immediate deadline, um, you have the luxury of working in categories of items. So for example, you know, look at all your kitchenware, look at all your books, look at all your shoes. Um, and look at um, look for quick hit areas. These would be things from phases of your life that are past, like you know your old college notebooks, work material from old jobs, equipment from sports that you no longer play. Um, you want to tackle those big projects, um, such as photos and papers, because they are very time consuming. Um, you want to let unwanted items go elsewhere. You have permission to do that. Um, and most importantly, you need to keep up the momentum and, and keep at it. Um, so um, lots of different options. You can toss it all in a dumpster, although um, it, I recommend that you don't do that because it can be very wasteful. Um, you can hire a clean out company, um, but try to find one that, um, that tries to you know, either donate, consign for you, uh, you know, recycle and only puts things in the trash as, as a last resort. Um, you may be able to sell things um, or consign them based on their, their value. I'll talk more about value in a minute. Um, uh, let's see, um, you can give away to others, but be mindful that may, they may not want your, your cast offs. Um, a word about value, since I just mentioned that, um, be aware that there are different kinds of value, right? There's, there's not only monetary value, but there's also sentimental value, the value that comes from how usable something is. And of course there's aesthetic value. 
Um, if you're trying to sell something, remember that the value of something is ultimately determined by the market and not by your own sentimental beliefs about what something is worth. Um, I want to say uh, just a few quick words about disposing of Judaica because that does come up very often when I'm working with people. There are basically two categories. Um, one, the first is Tash, Tashmishi Kadusha is the first category. These are um, items that contain the name of God, such as Torahs and Torah accessories, prayer books, mezuzah. Um, disposing of things is these items is traditionally done through burial and they are typically held um, in a separate room uh, called a geniza until they're able to be um, buried appropriately. Um, the other category is Tashmini Mitzvah, which is a category that includes most other ritual objects essential to Jewish life. Those would be things like kiddush cups, menorahs, um, seder plates and shofars. Those are able to be discarded when they're no longer fit for use but they should be disposed of um, in a respectful manner, uh, such as wrapped in, in paper or cloth before they're, before they're disposed of. So I've talked about how to get rid of stuff, but now just a few words about how to let your stuff go, um, because it can be very hard to let go of things that have been important to you. So the first thing is to be prepared to feel emotion and even grief at letting go of, of your things. So I'm just reminding you to think about being the curator of your collection. Uh, think about giving your items new life elsewhere uh, where they can be used and enjoyed. You can still have the memories without the things. Um, and remember that you don't have to get rid of everything, but by letting go of things from the past, you create physical and psychological space for the future and the present. It's a gift to your loved ones who won't have to deal with this task later, but it's a gift to yourself too, because the process of going through things um, enables you to reminisce, enables you to have more and clearer space and letting go often results in feelings of relief, satisfaction, lightness and peace of mind. So it's a lot, but if you remember nothing else from my section, Oh, it's your important documents and information. Please get rid of um, any uh, private items that might be hurtful for others to find. And please, please document the important stories, information, and lessons that would otherwise be lost after you're gone. So um, just final words um, for, for all of our material. I know we don't have much time left for questions. I just wanted to say, I know there's so much here, the goal isn't to overwhelm you, but to give you an idea of the scope and effort involved and ideas about how to get started. Again, the process and results will look different for, every, for everyone. So please remember that finished is better than perfect. Any progress is better than none. Success breeds success. And the common theme between our sections is the importance of making conscious choices in advance. Um, and not leaving them to others to make for you. There are lots of resources available. We will send you the resource list um, if you've given us your name in the chat. Um, I did also want to mention um, that if you are interested in pursuing this further, um, we do have, um, we do are running a small group workshop um, that to take people through this process, um, in a small group and with the support, you know, with us to provide guidance and support of peers. So if you have, you know, we plan to run a workshop coming up, we still have room. Um, and if you have any interest in that, please let us know uh, as soon as you can. And my email address is there. Um, and uh, as soon as you can, and, and no later than by the end of the week, because we're planning on doing this starting next week. So now, and I, and I apologize because we did go long, but we do have just a couple of minutes. Um, I do want to just say thank you again um, for, for your time and attention. And uh, we have just a minute or two if we have any questions. Susan? Yeah, Hilti, two things. One, your, your frame froze just as you were, good, you were saying, if there's nothing else you remember from the <laughs> presentation, and then you froze. OK. So, so if you could just say okay. that piece again, that's one. The second thing is that um, I, I believe you told me that if people did want to sign up for this uh, more personalized small group, that there was some kind of discount available. So yes, that, that's correct. We're, uh, we're offering a 
20% uh, discount on the workshop, just because a lot of the material will be the same. We'll go through it more slowly and in more detail, but there will be some repetition. I'll call it reinforcement, but we did want to offer a discount just in, in light of that. So, so thank you for, for mentioning that. The priority actions for my section were, again, enable access um, to um, important information, make sure your loved ones can find it, um, get rid of any private items that might be uh, hurtful for others to find. And please, please, very importantly, document the important stories, information, and lessons uh, that would be lost after you're gone. And along with that, that includes writing, um, writing names on the back of photos. That's a, a very common one. Go through, you know, if there are people that you know in the photos, go, go through the photos and write the names of the people in them so that your kids or someone else, you know, it doesn't inherit a box full of photos and no idea who those people are. So um, with that, I don't know, we're, we're just at 530. I don't know if we have another few minutes to take questions or not. We can, we can take a, a little time. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. And we and we can also, if people are, are prefer or more comfortable, um, you know, um, contacting one of us directly with a question afterwards, that's fine too. I, I think you have all of our email addresses. Um, I do, and I'll, I'll, I'll put those back up. Yeah, so feel free if, you know, someone has a specific question about, you know, a trust or something, um, feel free to, to contact me directly or, you know, one of the other two of us, but, um, but, but I think we can all stay on for a little while here and answer any immediate questions also. Yeah. I, I, uh, um, Andy, I just want to know, should you give everything away that you have while you're alive? So no one's waiting for you to be dead to get it. <laughs> um, I, you know, um, I guess it depends. Well, when you say give everything, what do you what do you mean by everything? Whatever you need, except what you need for your upkeep for the rest of your life, but you don't need to have or give people or, you know, I understand by being by creating beneficiaries, you're doing mm -hmm. that to a certain degree. Right. But, uh, you know, uh, I've all, all often wondered, you could do so much with your money for your kids and grandkids while you're right. alive. Yeah. So uh, I don't, you know, so, I, you know, it's hard to know exactly what you can, you know, what you're going to need to live on or not. Um, that said, I'll, I'll let I, them I support me. I certainly am a, a very strong advocate. And I bring this up with all of my clients that um, it's much more enjoyable and meaningful to share um, your inheritance, you know, with people, you know, while you're alive, when you can, you know, sort of share it with them. So for instance, um, if you know people have the ability to um, you know maybe help a grandchild with um, you know college or with um, you know their first purchase of a home or you know with their wedding something like that that can be really meaningful um, or um, you know if they've got even more resources and and you know could could um, could purchase a you know vacation home where the whole family can you know, when we get to this point after COVID, when the whole family can gather, you know, on, in the mountains or on the Cape or something, um, you know, that's a really, that's really nice. And you can, again, enjoy that with your kids and grandkids, other, other family members while you're alive rather than, than afterwards. But, uh, you know, it's sort of, um, unfortunately, none of us has a crystal ball in terms of knowing, you know, when we're going to go. So it, it's hard to, to measure how much am I going to need to live on versus how much can I afford to give away? So you, you, you do your best. Um, the other thing is, and again, I don't want to get into this here, but there, there actually are sometimes some tax advantages to actually holding on to property. Um, there's something called a step up in basis, which again, I don't want to, I don't want to bore people with that, you know, uh, five 30 in the evening with, but suffice it to say, maybe counterintuitive, but sometimes you're better off holding on to it than, than giving it away. But, but that's sort of beyond the scope today. So um, can, can I just chime in one thing on that um, it is just in terms of the, the your tangible property uh, in terms of giving that away. I, I mean, I would just sort of put in a word for if there are things that you that you intend to give to someone, you know, um, and it, you know, definitely consider giving it sooner rather than later. If somebody, you know, if somebody wants your piano, you know, or if somebody loves a particular piece of art, I mean, and you know, why, why not consider giving to them? And then they have 
they have the use and the pleasure in it for that much longer and you have the joy of of seeing them enjoy it so that i know that wasn't exactly your question but i just want to to mention that yeah i would certainly agree with that other other questions while we're all here on the screen together So going going once, going twice. <laughs> I bought oh, a um, question, but I had a comment. Oh, so sure. My husband was sick and we he knew he was dying. He left a whole file of in addition to everything that I needed to know in general, he left a list of the people that I should contact because he was still working and I didn't know them. So he left phone numbers and names, and it was so easy to contact yeah. them when he passed away, um, who was very organized. And yeah. I said, that was really, um, you know, information for me and I'll do the same for my children because there's friends of mine that they don't know at all who yeah. would like to know if I was really sick or I died or, you know, anything yeah. like that. So that was really a very helpful thing. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And I would say um, along with that, to know, you know, where, um, and, and I'm sure your husband did this, but but where where would someone find contact information for those people? So it's not just the list of names, but it's, here, you know, here's where my address book is, or, you know, oh, here's- But here's, he left names and phone numbers and addresses. He left the works. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely, you know, the return on investment, you know, a little bit of time put in, you know, during your lifetime can save, you know, maybe five, 10 times that, you know, after you're gone. So, um, so it's, um, it's kind of like, you know, pay now or pay later, but I, I think that you can pay a lot less now um, as opposed to having to pay a lot more later. So it's, right. it's time, it's, it's time and effort well spent. Right. And, it, and it's also a way of ensuring that, that what, what, will, what you want to happen will happen or making, making it more likely that that will be the case. Great. Well, I think we were able to capture um, everyone's email address that was interested in the resource list. So we'll get that out. And again, if, if anyone has any questions for anyone or all three of us, um, please don't hesitate to, um, to contact us. Um, let, let me just thank all of you for a wonderful, oh, I think we have one more question. I, I, think so, yeah. I just want to ask if we would have access to the recording for this session. Yes, the, the, um, the session has been recorded and it will be on the TBZ website. Great, thank you. Okay, because there were, um, as always, some people wanted to be here and couldn't, so we did record it. Yes, so you, you could see it at any time. And I also wanted to say that, um, Lori, we are gonna reach out to you regarding the, the workshop. I saw that on the chat, so thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so, so very much. Um, um, Arza, Andrew, and Hildy, you did a beautiful, beautiful job, and we're so very grateful to have had you uh, be with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Pleasure. Right. Thank, thank you. Happy for your hands time. to everybody. Happy hands. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> really wonderful. Really wonderful. Thank you so very much. Thank you for having us. Thank You're you. welcome. Take Thanks. good care. Bye-bye. Stay well, everybody. Yes, stay well, everyone. Yes.